Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to paying board members. Super exciting topic. My name is Hope Williams. I am a legal apprentice uh, for at Sustainable Economies Law Center through the Radical Real Estate Program. Um, yeah, really happy to be here and excited to talk about this. Um, what about you, Erica? Yeah, welcome. My name is Erica Sato. I'm an attorney and Equal Justice Works Fellow at the Law Center. Um, and yeah, this is a topic that we're covering by request from the other Sustainable Economies Law Center um, presentation that happened a couple months ago. So excited to get you all some of this practical information and everything will be recorded. So you can definitely take a look later. Um, so yeah, we did intros. Uh, Hope's going to do a little bit of disclaimer and background information. Um, then we're going to kind of dive into the practical pieces. So um, what you can do step by step to basically um, set a, set a, a compensation for your board members. And then we'll get into the more specific rules that you're, you should be thinking about as you're doing that. Um, in both the federal and the, the California context. And then um, we'll end with a little bit on other states outside of California and some Q&A. Okay. Awesome, thanks Erica. All right, this is our special disclaimer for Mr. Potato Lawyer. We want everyone to remember that the law is complicated and it changes. And this is only intended as an informational resource, but it might not cover all the relevant points for your specific situation, and it should not be relied upon as legal advice. So before making any radical changes to your organization's policies on compensation, please contact an attorney who is familiar with laws applicable to nonprofit organization in your state. Uh, an attorney can help your organization navigate governance and compensation practices, among other legal issues. Thank you, Mr. Potato Lawyer. Oh, sorry. Yep. Okay. So why is this important? Um, wouldn't you know it, paying board members actually ensures sustainable leadership. So by recognizing value and commitment, and compensating your board members, you'll demonstrate your commitment to recognizing their value and significant co contributions they can make to your cause. You're gonna attract and retain talented leaders by offering compensation to board members. It'll help attract individuals with diverse skills, experiences, and perspectives. And by providing financial support, you can tap into a wider pool of talent and attract folks who may otherwise be unable to volunteer their time due to financial and time constraints. And additionally, compensation serves as an incentive for board members to stay committed and engaged in their roles over the long term. Uh, you're gonna ensure equity and inclusion because by paying board members, you'll ensure that individuals from marginalized communities who often face financial barriers can actively participate in board activities. And compensation eliminates economic disparities that might prevent talented individuals from serving on the board, allowing you to foster a more diverse and inclusive leadership team. Um, accountability and expectations. Paying board members establishes a clear framework of account accountability and expectations. So compensation helps reinforce the understanding that Board service is a professional commitment and a significant responsibility. It also encourages board members to fulfill their duties diligently, con uh, contribute actively to decision-making processes, and provide the necessary oversight for effective governance. And finally, it's financial sustainability. Building a financially sustainable organization requires investing in key leadership roles. By compensating board members, you'll ensure stability and continuity in, our, in your leadership, reducing the risk of turnover and loss of institutional knowledge. Uh, the ex expertise and institutional memory that compensated board members bring to the table contribute to the long-term success and growth. You should do it. It's a good idea. 
Thanks, Hope. Yeah, so um, where can we start for understanding what rules limit how nonprofits can spend their money? Um, well, I'll just give a little bit of background here. So nonprofits, especially charitable 501c3s, are designed to organize projects for public benefit rather than for mutual benefit or private benefit. So generally that means that it's frowned upon and scrutinized for insiders who are running the organization to be receiving money from the organization because the view is that you know, the organization should be uh, giving resources to the charitable class of needy people who are being served by the organization, right? But there's also a recognition that nonprofits need to participate in markets to get the goods and services that they need. So for example, Nonprofits have employees. Um, they also have independent contractors. You might contract with a photographer for an event or bring in an IT consultant or something like that and pay market rate for those services. Um, so the people receiving those kinds of, of money are not part of the charitable class or the mission of the nonprofit, but they're needed in order to carry out the work of the nonprofit. So it's okay for the organization to pay expensive prices as long as that's based on the market rate. Now, we at Silk, and I imagine many of you like to push back on this kind of framework and argue that more mutual models should also be included in our vision for charitable work. Um, and I think the IRS is slowly changing its tune on this, but there still remains this essential dichotomy in the work um, between when resources are channeled to the charitable class on the one hand versus when resources are channeled to essentially kind of vendors of the organization that they need to hire to, to get the work done. So the board of directors occupies a special place within this. Um, at a traditional nonprofit, board members are expected to be professionals like lawyers, fundraising professionals, nonprofit professionals, um, and because they are the ultimate decision makers and they have these fiduciary responsibilities to the organization, um, they're seen as the ultimate insiders. So anytime organizational resources are channeled from the nonprofit to its board members, it's considered to be a potential conflict of interest and it does need to be done carefully. Um, and generally speaking, the way to do it under the law is to make the argument that they, like the photographer or the IT consultant, are essentially kind of vendors that need to be paid at market rates in order for the nonprofit to do its work properly. So with all of this in mind, in general, um, your board of directors should pull together some information about pay rates for comparable services, and that's called comparability data. Um, so pulling together data about what people are paid, um, uh, people who have comparable qualifications and are doing comparable work, and using that information to make a case about what the market rate is for those services and to inform how you set your own pay rates for your board. So even though here we might probably not believe in the power of the market and all of that, unfortunately, that's the way that the IRS has determined is appropriate. So if you're setting pay for each director individually, then you can look at that director's experiences and duties as a director, and then try to find information about jobs in the for-profit and the nonprofit world that are similar to those um, experience levels and duties, and then use that information as evidence of what the hourly market rate is for that type of work. Um, and other factors like the size and the geographic location of the organizations being compared is also relevant information. Um, I put a couple of links in the slides for potential options of where to find this information. There's you know, websites like Glassdoor, there's the Bureau of Labor Statistics where you can find um, information on certain industries and locations. And then there's also, um, you can go to the IRS and look up all of nonprofits 990s, their tax returns to find what they're paying um, their board of directors. Although a lot of them aren't paying anything, but um, you can still make a case that um, that, that yours should be paid. Um, 
Yeah, so then after you pull together all this information, how does the organization actually make the decision of whether and how much to pay your directors? Well, step one is to read your conflict of interest policy and do what it says, and that will really help go a long way in protecting you. So even though it's not actually required for all nonprofits to have a conflict of interest policy, you probably do have one because um, the application for 501c3 status asks about it and asks if you if you have one and what it says. Um, so there's a good chance that your conflict of interest policy looks something like the sample IRS one, um, which in which case it says that the interested director needs to identify the conflict and share that with the other directors and then recuse themselves and leave the meeting while the decision about the potential conflicted transaction is being made. Um, so none of that procedure is actually required by law, but again, it's in a standard conflict of interest policy. So if this is the case, then you can either set compensation for each director separately um, and have them leave the room one by one, or you can amend your policy to add a process for when all of your directors are interested and then just do it all at once. So if you're interested in amending your policy, you can check out our guide on conflict of interest policies to learn more about what the parameters are. Um, and that's linked on the slide as well. Um, one additional recommended step here for added protection and to preserve the spirit of conflict of interest policies um, is that even when all the directors are going to be conflicted um, or because all the directors are going to be conflicted, it's helpful to get input from other stakeholders of the organization. So that might be members if you have them, clients, constituents, partner organizations, whatever is the most relevant to your organization, just to show that you really got input on whether to pay your directors and how much that pay should be. Okay, so this is kind of a summary slide, but also this is the most important part potentially of this whole presentation, which is um, it's really important to document all this information and how you came to the decision that you came to. So after you find your comparability data, you bring it back to your board of directors for consideration and a decision. Um, you consult uh, potential outside parties. You'll wanna document all of that and take really good notes for exactly how the decision was made and the reasoning used to come to that conclusion. And ideally you'll just have a little write-up of like the board minutes, um, that you can easily attach on your, your 990, your tax return, because it will ask about this transaction. So you'll wanna have that readily available. Okay, so that was the basic practical pieces. And I think if you follow all of that, you should be okay in most cases, but I wanna go a little bit more in depth so that we can understand the specific rules that apply to different organizations. Um, to understand what exactly the legal limitations are happening here. So we first need a little bit of a basic shared understanding about what the structure of your organization is. Um, my assumption is that most of you are 501c3 nonprofit corporations, but um, let's talk a little bit about what that means. So to get on the same page about these things and how uh, what they are and how they work together, we like to use this cake metaphor where you can think of the sponge of the cake as the entity and the icing as the tax status. And you can mix and match them. And then there's also infinite possibility for the ingredients that you choose to make up your cake and your icing. And these are in your internal financial governance and operational structure and show up in your policies, practices, and bylaws. And those are the things that we spent most of this learning journey talking about when we talked about the you know legal pieces. So, um, but we won't focus on them today actually. So uh, <laughs> for us at Selk and likely for some of you, um, our CAKE is a California nonprofit public benefit corporation. And then our tax status is federal exemption under section 501c3. So we need to follow both sets of rules, those prescribed by California 
for its nonprofit corporations, and then those prescribed by the IRS and Congress for 501c3 organizations. Um, if your organization is also based in California, then it might be those same sets of rules. And if you're in a different state, then um, you'll have to follow the same federal 501c3 rules, but there might be different state nonprofit corporation rules. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to figure out what those rules are toward the end of the presentation. So turning to the rules specific to 501c3 tax exempt organizations, these rules are pretty similar to what we have already talked about, or, or they can be, um, following them can be achieved by doing what we already talked about. But um, yeah, specifically 501c3s have prohibitions on private inurement, sharing net profit, and excess benefit transactions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of those three things. Um, and for these rules, the IRS is gonna be the oversight body and if they don't like what you did, then um, the potential consequences would be that they could impose excise taxes on the individual who received the, the benefit, like a, a director, um, equal to the benefit that they received. Or in extreme cases, they can also revoke your tax exempt status. So starting with private inurement, um, this is pretty straightforward. It kind of goes along with the public benefit and charitable purpose stuff. So because 501c3s are meant to benefit the public and the charitable class as a whole, um, the benefits are not supposed to go too much to any individual or small group of individuals. Uh, basically, you don't want it to look like you're using the organization to channel money towards powerful individuals. And this rule isn't specific to insiders, but um, in practice, insiders are going to be the most scrutinized because there's potential for abuse. Um, but that said, some private benefit is okay as long as it's incidental and just part of participating in the free market. So this is kind of like a use your best judgment type of rule. Um, remember that lots of 501c3 hospitals and universities do pay their high level executive salaries of you know, close to a million dollars based on the idea that that's the market rate for people with these skills. So you probably don't need to worry too much about this as long as you're following the procedures that we talked about with the comparability data and the documentation. Um, so this next rule, profit sharing, is a really specific one. So with profit sharing, the issue is that nobody can ever own a nonprofit, so nobody should be benefiting from it in an ownership or shareholder type of way. So what that means is that compensation should never be set as a percentage of the org's profits or income. Instead, it should be based on the market cost of the services. So in this cartoon, we have a board member proposing dividing up all of the money equally so that the more that they raise, the higher each person's compensation. That's not allowed. The organization's financial position can be taken into account when determining pay rates, uh, mostly in the sense that, you know, if it's not doing so hot, it should pay less. But people shouldn't be getting raises just because there's extra money. It's okay to give raises, but you want to have a legitimate reason documented, not just that there is lots of profit. Okay. And then the last rule that I'll talk about from the IRS is around excess benefit transactions. So this is just the IRS's term for a transaction uh, with an insider, like a director or a high level officer, where the tax exempt organization paid out more than the benefit that they received. So again, this is a question of balancing which one is worth more in based on the market, right? So like the money or the services, and you want the services to be equal or the same as the money paid out. So this really gets to what we talked about with the market rate, comparability data, <clears throat> and documentation. And you just wanna make sure that anytime that you're entering into a transaction that could benefit an insider, you do that analysis, make sure you're not paying more than market rate and document that. Um, and I'll also just highlight one quirk of this rule, which is that there's a five year look back period for determining who's an insider. So if you enter into a transaction 
uh, with an ex-director or ex-officer, you'll want to make sure to follow these same procedures as well. Um, and if the IRS finds that you did have an excess benefit transaction, that's where they might impose excise taxes on the insider to take away that excess benefit. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Hope to talk a little bit about California rules. Thank you, Erica, California. So what do we have? Uh, we're going to zoom in on what is just and reasonable, mostly when it comes to compensation. And then who are the 49%, 49% interested rule? What is that? And then the limit on self-dealing transactions. Um, so reasonable compensation is the key concept here. It refers to just to the just right amount of pay for hardworking board members. While most directors generously serve as volunteers, there are cases where they may receive payment for their services as directors or officers. And in such instances, it is vital that these payments are fair and reasonable for the public benefit corporation, taking into account the services provided. So reasonable compensation is all about finding that sweet spot the fair and just right amount of pay for the hardworking folks involved in a nonprofit organization. It's the balance between giving credit where it's due and making sure it is in the organization's best interest. You'll achieve fair and just compensation by striking the right balance. And in the world of nonprofit organizations, compensating board members fairly is a very delicate task. And it involves finding the sweet spot that acknowledges their contributions while considering the best interests of the organizations. So California law does not provide a specific guideline for what constitutes reasonable compensation. Super helpful. Instead, it requires an evaluation on a case-by-case -case basis, considering the unique facts and circumstances involved. And as Erica mentioned before, the IRS does define reasonable compensation as the value typically paid for similar services by comparable enterprises in which similar in, in similar circumstances. And in other words, it's about assessing what is customary and what is appropriate. Uh, determining reasonable compensation involves striking that balance between giving credit where it's due and safeguarding the the organization's best interests, and it requires careful consideration of the spe specific context and ensuring that the compensation aligns with prevailing industry standards. So remember, the pursuit of reasonable compensation is an individualized process based on the specific circumstances. And this is my special cartoon that gives a shout out to California, taking the 99 and taking I-5, also known as the five, um, Anyone who's not in the state of California, I apologize for my inside joke. Okay, um, so the 49% interested rule, uh, as specified in the Sunny California Corporations Code of 5227, defines interested persons according to California law. It is a fundamental aspect of California nonprofit public benefit corporation law obligating California nonprofit corporations to comply with it. And 49% of your board of directors receive no compensation from the corporation other than their director role, promoting an unbiased board composition and excluding individuals with financial ties to the organization. Here is my cartoon on what interested parties will look like. So interested persons include those who have received payments from the organization within the past year, such as employees, independent contractors, and service providers. And the rule also extends to close family members of compensated individuals, preventing any sneaky arrangements from influencing board decisions. The disinterested parties party. The law mandates that at least 51% of directors must be disinterested individuals, meaning they do not receive any compensation from the corporation apart from their director role. They're just a director. So this rule ensures, again, an unbiased board composition, excluding individuals who have financial ties to the organization. Um, what happens when we're all having a party? So, Nevertheless, organizations 
still have the freedom to provide reasonable compensation to directors for their directorial performances, it is crucial to emphasize the director's responsibilities, including attending board meetings, preparing for success, and garnering support for the cause, because this approach ensures fairness and integrity in compensating directors while avoiding any improper practices regarding compensation for officers and employees. Um, so laws on self-dealing transactions. Um, let's, so this person obviously wants five bajillion dollars and then Google says, uh, as an accountant, they kind of want $27.23 on average. So in California, nonprofit corporations are bound by laws that prohibit directors on the board from engaging in self dealing transactions. These laws target situations where directors have a significant financial interest in the organization. This concept is distinct from the earlier discussed interested person standard. However, there are exceptions to this law. Exception number one, uh, compensation de decided by the board. When the board determines the compensation for a director serving in a directorial or officer capacity within the corporation. Consensus, consensus, consensus. Uh, transactions related to public or charitable programs. Transactions that are part of the organization's public or charitable programs are exempt. And these transactions must be conducted in good faith without any unfair favoritism and must ultimately benefit the intended beneficiaries of the program, including the directors. Um, more on the limit on self-dealing transactions. Option one, uh, if the transaction falls within these exceptions, you can proceed without concerns. However, if it doesn't, uh, the law provides two additional methods to ensure compliance. You can seek approval from the state attorney general here in California, that is Rob Bonta. Uh, the law grants the attorney general the authority to approve the transaction and waive any claims. To ensure compliance, you can apply for pre-approval from the attorney general. Option two, um, you got to ensure that the transaction benefits the organization, not the personal interest of the director. You got to confirm that the terms of the transaction were fair to the organization at the time it was made. You have to inform the board about all of the important details of the transaction and obtain their good faith approval. Approval should come from a majority of directors who are not financially interested in the transaction. Uh, and before making a final decision, the board should thoroughly investigate and determine that given the circumstances, the organization couldn't have obtained a better range, arrangement, even with reasonable efforts. So by following these guidelines, documenting your compliance, and prioritizing the organization's best interests, transparency, and fair decision-making processes, you can ensure that your transactions align with the law. Uh, so welcome to the exciting world of nonprofit corporations in California. Let's stay away from any sneaky self-dealing transactions and uphold justice and integrity like the true nonprofit superheroes that we are. Um, and within excessive compensation, it is important to note that when a self-dealing transaction is unfair to the corporation and results in unreasonable charges or excessive profit for the interested director, the corporation suffers damage. In such cases, Rob here, our attorney general and other relevant parties may sue the directors to recover the actual damages suffered by the corporation along with interest. And the punitive damages, which may also be sought in circumstances, uh, any recovered damages are returned to the corporation and typically Rob here, the attorney general, seeks the permanent removal of interested directors and any other directors responsible for the damage. So uh, we know that some of y'all are not based in California. So we suggest going to your local lattes for law coffee shop um, and bust out that serious lawyering briefcase and contract law book and Google it. Um, you can also go and chat with your local law library librarian and ask them questions. 
uh, they know everything and are always stoked to help out. And 100% ask an attorney that practices in your state. Um, now we have our summary checklist. Um, so you're gonna wanna do federal compliance. This is actually a very general outline of everything, but you want general compliance, IRS compliance, state compliance. You got to follow the conflict of interest policy. You need to do comparability data, AKA industry standards, just and reasonable compensation, 49% interested rule laws on self-dealing transactions. And one of the most important things, document everything, document everything, document everything and document everything. Um, thankfully, California's AG Rob here has a very solid guide that's online and we'll drop that into the chat box. And um, thank you so much. I'll end there. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to clarify in case it, you know, this was a lot of information and a lot of different rules, but so many of these do have exceptions for when they're, they're, they're trying to protect uh, the organization when the director is uh, potentially conflicted or potentially getting some kind of benefit. But there's exceptions for when you're just paying the director for their services as a director. So that's that should be like a limited amount. It shouldn't be a full-time position. Um, and, you know, it's they shouldn't be like an employee of the corporation or anything like that. But as long as it's just that limited piece, then there is that exception um, under, you know, all of the 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 forty nine percent interested rule and the laws on self dealing transactions that um, that Hope talked about. Um, yeah, and then did we want to also go through the example of the state? Maybe. Oh, sure. Yeah. Let's see here. Since we have uh, the extra minutes. Yeah. Uh, let's see. All right. So as Erica and I were perusing all the different state laws, um, for some reason, we settled on Washington state. Super fun. Uh, and what we have here, and Erica, I'm actually going to drop this real fast in the chat. Yeah, so I literally just like Googled Washington State Nonprofit Corporation statute, and then you can find it. Usually there's some, there's like a corporation's code. Um, and then one, there will be a section on LLCs, a section on, you know, different kinds of entities, and one of them will be nonprofit corporations. And then you can go in there and just read what are the actual laws applicable to nonprofit corporations, and look for terms like self-dealing, interested, conflict. Yeah. Um, so in looking this up and tracking it, I just dropped a bunch of links for your viewing pleasure. Washington State Legislator going to the Revised Code of Washington, aka RCW, selecting Title 24 RCW. These are really fun links. Then selecting Chapter 24.03A, and then continuing on to other segments, which is also 24.03A.545. That's a lot of, that's a, those are big mouthfuls. However, um, I apologize. I did have screenshots of this because that does feel really abstract, but here is kind of a how-to within this. And um, we'll make sure to put those screenshots in with the slide deck once we're done. Yeah, all the links that we're dropping into the chat are also in the uh, slide notes if you're watching the recording. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it from us. So do we have any questions? Oh, 
Oh yeah, go ahead, Joe. Joe has a question and you can unmute yourself if you'd like. And I can also stop the recording. Does that sound okay? Mm-hmm. 